Droider is a term reserved for a spider centaur, which is to say, a human or humanoid body from the waist up protruding from a spider's thorax. But a drider is actually a dryoblast spider. It's a very specific animal linked to the lore of Greyhawk and the Forgotten Realms. Because of fantasy authors and artists' tendency for making women all sexy, since they don't understand a woman doing anything else in a story, this horrible punishment and torment has been turned into a brand new fetish. I will discuss that in this video, but first let us discuss centaurs. What is a centaur? A centaur means a man body on horse neck, and comes from the word kentoros or kentoros, which means piercing bull or potentially bull slayer. The idea comes from a story wherein horse archers, a historically powerful unit, fended off a stampede. The original idea from centaurs allegedly comes from whenever someone saw a horse archer and assumed that it was one being for whatever reason. The human was atop the horse, the horse had its head down, etc. According to some, the Aztec people thought the same of the invading Spanish. There's also evidence of centaur-like people in India and Russian myths and legends. Greek myth holds that there were centauridae's or female centaurs, which, knowing fantasy authors, is likely a way to experience bestiality while making it less creepy. Ovid writes on them, paying special attention to how they're like centaurs, but they got breasts and soft skin and hate wearing clothes. He begins like this. In the high woods, there was none comelier than all of the centaur girls. He continues the line later. Twice a day, she bathed her face in the clear brook that fell from Pagasay's high forest. Twice she plunged her body in its flow, nor would she wear on her left side and shoulder any skin but what became from her best chosen beasts. I really had to make sure that last word was beasts and contained no R's. Let's have a brief interlude. I hate Ovid. Ovid is an old Greek poet, and he's an idiot. He is the source of Athena punishing Medusa for the crime of being raped, and before he wrote his version of the myth, Medusa was born a monster, like her sisters. In Ovid's version, this becomes a plot hole since only Medusa was raped, but her sisters exist and are still monsters. So yes, for those keeping track, the tragic backstory and the thing where the gods are evil and Athena's kind of crazy comes from Ovid. He's also the source of the myth of Arachne, the first spider girl who we will talk about later which is another myth where feminist icon Athena is presented as the villain while the men in the story are sinless babes. Athena is typically the only god who isn't a complete lunatic and one of the few early examples of a woman who can do things without a man. Ovid turning her into that is foolish. Suffice it to say, Ovid is a cunt. Anyway, female centaurs have precedence, likely for being all sexy based on Ovid's use. Female centaurs are actually an early example of monster girls, but the real trend with it originates with moe anthropomorphism, that thing where Japan draws historical figures, kitchen appliances, bugs, animals, boats, and yes, monsters as anime girls, but we'll get there, I promise. The First Spider Now to discuss Arachne. She was a weaver who challenged Athena, who is apparently a goddess of weaving. I don't know how Athena finds the time to do a stereotypically feminine job when she's Busy being the greatest tactician who ever lived, Ovid. In other stories, Arachne is asked to recant or refute the statement she's a better weaver than Athena, or that she was just better than Athena, or claimed herself better. Suffice it to say, Athena cursed her with a small, fat body with a lot of legs, and that's why spiders make webs, because of Arachne's weaving. Spiders have a history of being female, or feminine characters, Peter Parker being a rare subversion, because male spiders are usually smaller, weaker, and often food for their larger, more dangerous, and powerful wives. Which, I have to say, is just living the dream. This is often the reason Arachne is a female in the story, since spiders are thought of as a feminine species because of this. The Latin version of her name is Araneus, which is the scientific name of a lot of spiders. It's the genus of orb-weaving spiders, who are the spiders that make the stereotypical circular webs you see in gardens and walk through when you least suspect. The Arnaeus exhibit extreme sexual dimorphism, with some spider mommies being ten times the size of their husbands. These temptuous ladies often sometimes eat their mates or mutilate their genitals. As the most stereotypical spider, thanks to how large and noticeable the webs are, this is where most people's thoughts of spiders originate. This is a good basis, but let's discuss a few more spider myths. Other spiders. 
The genus of spiders, Nephilia, comes from a Greek word that means fond of weaving. I think that's wonderful. It's a very common thing that spiders are thought of as weavers. Babylon is something of the cradle of humanity, and so has, has a lot of firsts, especially for myths. In Babylon, the weaving goddess was named Utu, and lived in a web, predating Arachne. By a couple thousand years, I think. A lot of myths prevent, present the spider as a trickster, since they aren't big enough to use overwhelming force, and because the webs are seen as traps or cons. West Africa, naturally, has the trickster Ananasi. Anansi. I've heard a few different pronunciations, but Anansi is what I have written. Um, he's a storyteller. He's an interesting case because he's not evil, just tricksy. And a lot of people think of him very fondly. A bunch of different Native American cultures also worship spiders. The Lakota people have their own spider trickster. And many say that the constellation we know as Osa Major is actually a big spider. I personally like that a lot better. The Hopi and Navajo people have the spider woman or spider grandmother, which is another playing on the traits of a spider being feminine. Spider-Man, the superhero, isn't a strong or fast hero. He is strong and he is fast, but not the strongest or fastest, so he usually has to outsmart a trick his foes. Another example of a trickster. Now, here's where I begin to reach. Charlotte, from Charlotte's Web, is also a trickster. And now this one's very recent. There's a Japanese light novel, and I believe soon to be anime, called So I'm a Spider, So What? When the protagonist is turned into a default level 1 spider enemy in a video game and has to outsmart people to survive. These are more tricksters. Now, I have to cite uh, Harry Potter, contractually speaking, because they had giant spiders. So let it be known that I only have to cite Harry Potter, written by Hatsune Miku, because I have to. The acromantulas from there are much closer to wolf spiders or tarantulas. Tarantulas or giant spiders are typically less trickstery and more brutish. This is the last one, but here's an interesting note. In Norse, cobwebs are called lokanet, which mean Loki's net. This is because only a trickster such as Loki would make things like that. Also, this is another example of spiders being tricksters. As for them being feminine, well, I'm not sure about that. Loki's pretty gender fluid, if I must say. Cobwebs originates from cop web. Cop is an old English word that means spider. You may also spell it lop. This is where Tolkien gets the word shelob from lop or web. And then the she is because she's a lady. So it's she web. Tolkien is naturally a very important source of myths because of the legendarium he created and how everything in D&D is stolen from him besides a few things that we will talk about in this series. Japanese myths. Now we get a little closer to our source. Japan is the origin of a few monsters that are scary but also have a sexual aspect as well as a few different spider monsters. This often influence, influences the modern character design of a drider in a fantasy RPG set in Japan, or originating from Japan. Japan has two web-spitting spider monsters that I could find. The Tsuchigumo, or dirt spider, and the Umigumo, or sea spider. Gomo appears to just mean spider. Tsuchigumo hides in the earth and attacks from there, while the Umigumo hides along the coastline of Kyushu. Traditional Oni, you know. Same deal. But there's a third, more fun one. The Jorogumo, or prostitute spider, is a spider demon that can shapeshift into an attractive woman. It attempts to ensnare men so it can eat them by web or by wiles, and most tales involve the one man being able to resist long enough to defeat or repel it. Dark Elves and Loth Gary Gygax, long may he be remembered, did the world a great service with his use and creation of the Dark Elves. Most of the rest of D&D is swiped from miscellaneous myths and Tolkien. But the Dark Elves have a lot of originality. Which means that they were stolen by everyone else, but oh well. The Dark Elves, or Drow of Greyhawk slash Forgotten Realms, the lines are blurry, all follow this one goddess named Loth. Let's talk about her for a moment. But before that, we must talk about the Drow. The Drow were all once normal elves, and Loth a goddess and wife to Corlon the Relthian, elf god, a pretty boy, and bigot. Or sometimes they were always Dark Elves, but they weren't always evil. At some point there was a war, the Dark Elves paraded in the Underdark, having lost the war. 
we just wanted to lose, naturally. Uh, while there, they developed an insidious evil culture based around betraying fools and backstabbing friends. And it's great. Loth is known as the Spider Queen. She's the master of the demon web pits. As mentioned in my previous video, she's both a demon and a god, which just makes her the best. Spiders are sacred to her, and so drow often all have tons of spider paraphernalia and fashion. Their cloaks have webs on them, they use venom in combat, and their tables and chairs all have eight legs. No, really, that isn't a joke. Loth, being the goddess of drow, is one of the most drow-like drow to ever betray someone. And so she has particularly high standards, and as a result, harsh punishments for failure. Drow who screw up and don't escape are forcibly warped into a drider, a drow spider. The process is so painful, it wipes the victim's memory, since to risk remembering the pain is far too dramatic for the drow in question. I'm not sure if that's actually how it works, but since magic is involved and elves have weird memories, what with easily living to 700, perhaps I shouldn't complain. In some laws, they don't even forget everything, so whatever. These driders from the Forgotten Realms are tough enemies and a reminder not to screw up in low size. In many cases, the bloated, melted bodies of the driders are warped into a sexless thing, androgynous, genderless, and sickly. Hey, me too, man. They can't breed children since they're a mutate. That makes sense. In other laws or editions of D&D, the driders often do maintain their elfin traits, like a feminine face or large breasts, because fantasy writers are fantasy writers. The sexy ones typically still cannot breed. In Eberron, another D&D world, the drow are instead linked to scorpions, and here they become Skorow. Skoro. Skrow. Skorow? Skoro. Perhaps even a more labored portmanteau than Dryder. Skorow are revered instead of bullied. It's an honor to be one, so it seems. You are the chosen. You have been fated for greatness. So let's consider what dryders are right now. Drow are a sexy feminine race that's temptuous and lusty. In the same way, dwarves and elves are masculine and feminine. Drow and orcs are evil feminine and evil masculine. Which is why I like male elves and female orcs. Hashtag not all drow, but this is, not how, most, this is how most writers handle them. Now, spiders are tricksters or evil, and often feminine or female. Some of the monsters based on spiders have a sexual aspect, like the Jorogumo. Combining these things is this close to a fetish for many, especially considering centaurs also got sexualized. Japan. So add in Japan. Japan already has a view of spider women being sexy, and then you give them driders. D&D was actually pretty popular in Japan, with things laid as Dark Souls taking ideas from the six stats system, not even changing the names of strength decks or int, and having a fancy and magic system using preparation and slots, and Final Fantasy I was essentially a simplified version of 2e. Consider this. There's an anime called Record of Lodos War, which is based off of the author's D&D game. First of all, fuck yes. Secondly, Lodos War has an early example of dark elves in anime, and I believe that Lodos is to blame for why Japan just has dark elves being tanned elves. Really old depictions of dark elves are black people with pointy ears and white hair. This is a little oof. Picture a dwarf saying this. They're the evil elves. Their skin's all dark. You can tell they're evil because of their dark skin. Yikes. In later editions, Drow are very clearly an obsidian black, something inhuman and basically physically impossible to be without a lot of mutations. Their pointed or avian features are accentuated, their ears are made longer, their hair in anime silver as opposed to old man white. Some works, such as Warcraft or Voltron, make their elves even more obviously inhuman by giving them skin tones in blue or purple, making their cases, making their eyes glow red or purple, etc. Japan, however, has a tendency to make them ambiguously brown, with hair in human colors, in many cases blonde. I think this is either because of the translation of Tui was weird in Japan, or because Lodos War just affected that many people, and they made their elves look like that. They could have also spread around the art of dark elves with realistic skin tones a little more. In a similar instance, Japan's depiction of orcs usually makes them pig-faced and male, a D&D trope about 50 years outdated. Orcs had pig faces in first edition and really haven't since, and female orcs appear with relative rarity. I don't know why Japan hasn't seen fit to update their depictions, though, again, I must say I'm referring to the country of Japan as the source of it, but really it's 
a bunch of fictional authors, no, fiction writing authors who live in Japan. But this is why orcs are like that in Japan. It may also have something to do with that oni are typically used as the author wants the tropes brought about by orcs or yodna. It's because of this I feel confident in my claim that Japanese dark elves are like this because of first edition. Also, for whatever reason, dark elves are often the slutty elves, being more promiscuous than their light-skinned counterparts, which is just oof. Lots of hentai features non-dark elves as virgin or inexperienced, and dark elves as rock or slattens, ready to get dicked. That actually has more roots in D&D, since drow have a higher birth rate than their surface elf counterparts. But that's because the more babies you have, the more child soldiers you have. And if any of them, su- and if any of them survive, then the more regular soldiers you have. Of course, drow are also a little more seductive of st- and stuff, but it's a little weird. I'm not offended as it, I'm not offended by it as I normally would be, since it's about elves. But that might be why that is to begin with, since it's a fictional race. The only way anyone can get offended is on their behalf, unless the fictional race is heavily based off of a real race of people. Anyway, drivers get to Japan. They make them sexy. Japan does it to everyone. From aircraft carriers to Roman emperors. That's basically the end of it. I've been talking this whole time for essentially that sentence. This has been my very long and ridiculous exploitative view on dryers. I don't think they're sexy. Well, that's a lie. They shouldn't be, but they are. I can't deny it. Unfortunate. That's the end of this video, but I have one more note for you. Mon Musu, Monster Musume, Daily Life with Monster Girls, is one of the rare works to feature a spider drinking caffeine and getting drunk, which is actually what happens. There's a video called Spiders on Drugs, and a real experiment based off that video, or possibly vice versa, wherein they test several arachnids with drugs. Spiders appear to get drunk off of it, which is an interesting case. Some people think that plants began to develop caffeine as a way to defend against bugs, and the fact that humans just got in there and invented Starbucks is just, wow, it says something about the human spirit. Easily crushable. I'll see you guys in the next video in another two weeks. Be ready.